great. And also, of course, this goes without saying, you guys are cool, you get it, but don't take any pictures, don't take any videos, and please don't heckle. Um, I can't imagine what an NPR heckle would be like, though. It was like, you're not fully considering the socioeconomic impact of what you're saying, sir. <laughs> you're no Kai Rizdahl. <laughs> Big Kai Rizdahl fans, right on, brah. <laughs> I really love uh, playing here in Seattle. And um, I, when I was here once, this wasn't this time, but uh, last time I was here, I did find on the ground as I was walking a magazine that was entitled Tinkle Digest. <laughs> I don't know what was in it because I didn't touch it. Um, <laughs> but I took a photograph of it to send to my friend because I thought it was funny. And, uh, and on the cover of Tinkle Digest was just a, a photograph of an elephant with a tiny bird on its back and, and an old Asian man in a boat. So. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine as to what was inside Tinkle Digest. I have no idea. But I took a photo of the cover, texted it to a friend who I haven't texted with in about six months, and I just sent it by itself uh, with no explanation. And he immediately texted back, who is this? Understandable, just sent Tinkle Digest by itself. I said, it's Kurt, saw this, thought you would think it was funny. He immediately responds, you got the wrong number. <laughs> Turns out I did. <laughs> I had just texted Tinkle Digest to a stranger. <laughs> now normally, this is where a text conversation ends, but instead I texted back, you're a wrong number. And he immediately texts it back, listen, pal, which is a great way to start a text. <laughs> listen, pal, I don't know who you're trying to reach, but you got the wrong number. I do not know of anyone by the name of Kurt. Again, ample opportunity for this to end. <laughs> but instead I text back, you probably know me by my street name. <laughs> and he writes back, what's your street name? And I was like, oh no, what is my street name? I didn't know what to write and so I ended up, I got a little drunk and I just wrote, Dr. Depends. <laughs> and he didn't respond and I followed it up, like the adult diaper but a doctor. <laughs> I thought we could have been best friends but no, he never responded. I, uh, I was recently at a dog park, um, not because I have a dog, but because I like to creepily stare at other people's dogs. <laughs> and I saw this one dog, he was humping this other dog, and uh, the woman who owned the dog doing the humping just went, oh no, 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 that's a bad idea. And just reached down and grabbed him by his harness and lifted him off mid-hump, and then he just continued to hump mid-air. <laughs> and then she put him down, he kind of hump walked away. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> but I wish I had had that in my life when I was single. <laughs> like a giant hand that would reach down from the sky <laughs> and intercede when I was making bad decisions in my life. <laughs> Just like, oh, no, 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 that's a bad idea. She's incredibly emotionally unstable. Oh, no, 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 her Maroon 5 t-shirt is not ironic. <laughs> oh, she has more cats than toes. <laughs> Which raises the question, does she have 11 cats or has she lost toes? <laughs> I, um, I travel a lot as a comedian, so I obviously spend a lot of time in airports and uh, hate airports, I hate them a lot. I mean, do you guys remember train stations? Train stations were built as cathedrals to human ingenuity. And then they got to airports and they're like, meh, fuck it. Let's make it look like a maintenance hallway of a mall in 1984. <laughs> like Terminator 2 is gonna start up at any second back here. But I get this thing, when I get into security, I get really nervous and anxious for no reason. Like I'm immediately like, 
Oh no, did I pack my gun that shoots drugs? <laughs> like, that's not a thing. I just invented that, and now I'm worried about it. But I found out the best way to go through security. You guys can use this. When you get to the thing that spins around and nobody knows what it does, but somebody's looking at you naked, when you get to that thing, uh, instead of asking for a pat-down, you just say, uh, I'd like the free body massage. <laughs> They're not going to know what you're talking about right away. But finally, they'll lead you off for a pat-down. That guy's first question to you is, do you know how this works? And you just go, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then as you get pat-down, just moan just a little bit. <laughs> just like, mm. Mm. Do you find anything? <laughs> if all of us do that once, that will disappear. <laughs> and then, when you're in the airport, you're just trapped. You're just trapped. And the only things to eat are Sbarro and Cinnabon. Sbarro, which in Italian means, don't put that in your mouth! <laughs> and Cinnabon, the only food scientifically proven to smell 1,000 times better than it tastes. <laughs> and I don't know, so there's something about flight delays that get, I get them all the time and that it makes me existential. I was, I was at the Denver International Airport for six hours the other day and I, and I saw this moment that I thought perfectly encapsulated the meaninglessness of life. I saw a cleaning lady come upon just a lone flip-flop just by itself. You know, and I saw her pause for just a second before she sweeped it up and threw it away. Just pause for a moment like, oh, what fresh absurdity has life thrown in my path today? <laughs> a single flip-flop. A useful item in a useless context. There's no other flip-flop around. It's now become trash. It's her job to get rid of these things. And I can see her contemplating like, oh, I don't want to throw this away, but I have to. You know, she probably doesn't want to work at the airport, but I'm sure it pays a little bit more than working at somebody's house. And at least there, nobody's going to accuse her of stealing anything. And I know on some level, she knows that that flip-flop came from dinosaur stuff. She knows that billions and billions of creatures died for no no reason, only to sit in the ground, sit for an unimaginably long period of time, only to be pulled, lugubriously pulled out of the ground by men, greedy men and dirty men, and made into polyurethane, and then assembled, probably by a Mexican child in a factory, where they chain lock the emergency exit so nobody can run out for a smoke. And I'm sure that flip-flop thought it was gonna have the best life, just flipping and flopping going on vacation, getting ice cream, not here alone by itself on the floor of the Denver International Airport. <laughs> and she just sweeped it up and threw it away, back to the ground from whence it came. And I remember seeing that flip-flop and thinking, it was worth throwing that flip-flop on the ground for that. <laughs> all right, we're gonna get the show started. Before we do, before we do, I, I used to write all my stand-up on these large post-it notes, like large poster-sized post-it notes. And so in, my, in my, the first room of my apartment, when you would come into my apartment, it was just covered in my writing. And my friend Albertina came over one day and she was like, you can't bring a woman back here. You look like the Unabomber. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? These are all funny jokes. And she says, it just says here, do bad decisions exist, question <laughs> mark. And I was like, that's a funny joke. She's like, no, that's a crazy person thought. <laughs> But this was her idea. She said, you know what would be funny is if you wrote on your wall, list of people I need to kill, and then had like eight names with the first one crossed off. <laughs> I was like, that is funny. So I did that. Uh, 
but I thought it would be even funnier if the last name just said random. <laughs> so flash forward like three months, and I have finally convinced a young lady to come back to my apartment with me. And as I'm putting the key in the door, I remember that I have a list of people I need to kill on my wall that needs some explaining. She sees it, she kind of freezes. I go into repair mode, I'm like, this is a joke. I explain the whole thing, I'm a comedian, this is the whole thing. And she calms down. But then, I just can't help myself. <laughs> and I slowly cross off random. <laughs> and she left, she totally left. <laughs> But she called a car, I waited outside with her. I was like, you gotta admit, it's pretty funny. I committed to that bit. <laughs> She's like, you're gonna die alone. I was like, oh yeah. All right, you guys ready to get this show started? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring out your visual and auditory performers. Uh, please, on the video ones and twos, welcome to the stage, Keith Scratch. On guitar from Noveller, please welcome to the stage, Sarah Lipstate. From On Fillmore, Darren Gray. And On Percussion, Glenn Kochi. And now is a very special moment. It's that moment we've all been waiting for. A little something that goes a little bit like this. Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. <laughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. Why? From <laughs> WNYC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your hosts for this evening, Jan Aberrat and Robert Krolwich! And we can see you too. I mean, this is kind of interesting. We, we, I mean, this is the city that I first discovered bicycle polo. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. Quidditch. I, I saw people playing Quidditch. I, a nine year old invited me to play Quidditch. Quidditch. I, mean, I said, this intergenerational play up in Cal Anderson Park. You <laughs> really unusual. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, we, since we're all here yes. and we're all accounted for, shall we? I guess we shouldn't begin, because that would, that would be no, wrong. No, I mean, normally in a show, in a typical show, it would begin with a beginning-ish thing. Like, you know, <clears throat> once upon a time, the princess, having slept most of the night, woke up and saw the dwarf for the first time. Or something that's sort of, you know, a beginning-ish. We yeah. don't, we're not. We're not going to do that. No, we're going to actually begin with, yeah. with the end. So we should start this, um, this with, a, with an old, we're going to do ending stories, so you might as well start with a really old one. Yeah. This one goes back, oh. About uh, 66 million years, long, long time ago. Indeed, you know, and, and this is in terms of the ending sh stories we could pick. This is a big one. Yeah. And it's a bit of a mystery. Kind of a puzzle, yeah. It involves dinosaurs, so I think just to set the mood for people here, we should we should think of dinosaur-like words to, to describe a dinosaur. Yeah, well, you know, when I think of a dinosaur, I see a creature that is powerful. Powerful is good, of course. You might want to refer to the scaliness of the dinosaur. Yes, yeah, scaly. Uh, feathery, by the way. Because, Indeed. Yes, they had feathers. Toothy. Toothy and massive. Yes. Majestic. Well, particularly majestic, because dinosaurs were around for 200 million years, dominated the Earth a thousand times longer than us. You know, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the dinosaurs just went away. Yeah. And that's the mystery. Like, what happened to them? Where'd they go? How'd they go? People have been debating this forever. Dinosaur extinction has been an issue as long as we've known about dinosaurs. Yeah, I mean, like, you get one theory, then another theory, yeah. then another theory. Oh. And, you know, it would be so much easier for the scientists, and for mm. you and I right now, frankly, yeah. if we could just ask somebody who was there. 
an eyewitness. Well, she can, no, see, you can't go back in time. No. You know, no. So it's not happening. Alas. Hmm. Well, this is convenient. If it's tr if it's real, I don't know whether it's. Maybe let me just see if it if it. Uh, it is real. real. I I think it is. Well, hey, wait, hey, 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 hey. Why don't you ask him what we should talk about? I mean, we have all these theories here. See which one he thinks is worth talking about. That's a great idea. Maybe you should do it, because I think you might find it interesting. No, I mean, this is your thing, man. You, you know about this stuff. It's not my thing. I just, I just, I think it's as much as your thing as it is my thing. I well, you're older. You just, you ask Older is not, you don't put an older per... <laughs> I don't go, want to. Just ask him. Ask him. Hello? Ah, I don't speak dinosaur. I don't have the words. It just growls all the time, and I don't know what it's saying. Well, if we if could you don't know what it's saying, it, you it's can't... Not, it's, it, it, we just need to know how to talk to it. I don't know how to talk to it. Does anyone here know how to speak to this thing? It's a... It's a... It's a... It's a, Excuse a reptile. Me? Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Um, Kurt? I speak dinosaur. You do? How yeah. did you learn dinosaur? Oh, uh, I went to Evergreen. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I majored in uh, dinosaurs and paper clips. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good boy. You're a good boy. <laughs> all right. Well, well listen, well, we have all these theories. Can, yeah. If we ask him about it, can you translate for us? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. He says, Coolio. Okay. His, he's a little behind on slang. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So, uh, what do we call it? Oh, uh, it's Raoul. 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 It's Raoul. It's a very long O. Raoul. Oh, Raoul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Maybe start with this I'll one. I'll start right with here. this one. Okay. Raoul. <clears throat> Are you familiar with Pravitz and Connery's article in Paleobiology called Volcanic Eruptions and Cretaceous Lava Emulsions, which suggests that your species and all the dinosaurs were made extinct by enormous volcanoes exploding together? <clears throat> Uh, he said he stopped paying attention about midway through to that. Uh, 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 but he did hear volcanoes and no way to volcanoes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. Well, no, this, right. this, one, this one here. Sure, okay. okay. Uh, Raul, here's another theory. This, this was big in... This was big in 1980. Uh, it goes like this. So you and your kind spent too much time in the sun. You got cataracts. You couldn't see where you're going. You began to run off cliffs. Uh, he basically said, quite frank. <laughs> oh, he's got a lot to say. He said, quite frankly, Jad, he's insulted that someone with your brain size would even think that was possible. <laughs> well, then, then do, the, do the big one here. This okay. Because this is the one, you know. All right. Raul, look at me over here. He was here. looking at you. He's got eyes on the side of his head. It's <laughs> a good point. It's a good point. Okay. What about an asteroid? Oh, oh, it's okay, girl. Oh, calm down. Oh, she's very scared. Oh, he, oh, she, she says, okay, yes, that's true, but it's not the way you think it happened. Wait, it, girl, wait. It's certainly it's a girl, Raul. I don't understand that, but <laughs> still, that's interesting. It's we're right, but it's not the way we thought it happened. Okay, so we all think we know this story, right? The story of the asteroid that hit the Earth 66 million years ago. You learned it in grade school. Well, it turns out there are some scientists. We were surprised to learn. There are scientists who have been st investigating this moment further, forensically probing this moment, and they have a crazy new theory as to what actually went down that day. Actually, this theory is so odd, and when we first encountered it, we thought it was so unlikely that we, were, we basically threw it out for a while. Didn't seem possible. But then when we looked at the details, strangely, 
the details suddenly became kind of plausible, so... So we want to run you through what we've learned, just to see what you think. Okay, so we're going to do that right now. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to start you off with a guy, well, the guy who started it off for us. It's a guy named Jay. Jay Malosh, professor at Purdue University, and I study impact craters, among other things. Not only can Jay Malosh create impact craters with his mind, but he and his colleagues have been investigating this moment almost as if it were a crime scene that happened not 60 some odd years ago, a million years ago, but, but yesterday. And the story that they've put together, it's more than just interesting. It's frankly, it's frankly terrifying. And weirdly specific, as it happens. Take, for example, the seemingly simple question of when. When did it happen? You don't mean like the year, because that would be a little too specific. No, I, I don't know if you remember, but Jay got even more specific than that. This was a casual question that I threw out. When did you think it happened, more, thereabouts? Listen to his answer. Here's my question. And By the way, remember. do we know anything about seasons? Was this a warm, a particularly warm? Actually, it was between, uh, well, this is a bit of a stretch, but it was sometime between June and July. Really? Wow. You can say that and so specifically? How would you know that? The reasoning is we, we can, for example, um, in... This was, the, uh, this was the first surprise. It's kind of a controversial idea, but it basically goes like this. Jay says, scientists have found some pollen in rocks which date from that time. Two different kinds of pollen. This is pollen right here. And based on an analysis of those two kinds of pollen? We know that the um, impact took place between the flowering of the lotus and the flowering of the water lilies. Whoa. Wow. Okay, so that's a lotus you see flowering on the left. It's a water lily flowering on the right. Fossils found at the impact site that had pollen from both of these flowers in the same rock would suggest that the impact did in fact take place somewhere between June and July. It's one of those things in geology, we, we get a, a glimpse of a, a moment far, far back in time. So, let's go deeper into that moment. All right, everybody, let's collectively rewind our minds back in time, tens of millions of years into the past, 66 million years ago, to be precise. There they are, majestic beasts, hanging out on the plains, eating their lotus leaves. Sometime in June, June 17th, let's say. And everything on this day? Pretty much normal. This particular fateful day was no different than any of millions and millions of previous days as far as the dinosaurs were concerned. But if there were any astronomers at the time, which there weren't, they might have had some inkling that something was coming because... Had they looked up? They would have seen... A tiny little... Dot of light in the sky. And it was there day after day, always in the same spot at roughly the same time of day. Or as planets, the moon, move with respect to the stars. This would have had a constant bearing. And an old seaman could tell you that if you see something constant bearing, that's on a collision course with you. And that thing, of course, is our asteroid. Zeroing in on the Earth. Actually, it seems to me maybe you oughtn't to stick around for this next section, because you're not going to find it that pleasing, and it might make you nervous. So if you go there, I'll say some stuff to them about this asteroid, because we know a thing or two about it from the size of the crater and from the amount of certain minerals found at the impact site. We know that the asteroid was roughly six miles wide, and then again, roughly six miles long, which makes it approximately the size of Manhattan Island. Or viewed another way, you could say... Or, or, or Mount Everest. It's roughly the size of Mount Everest. That is Doug Robertson, a geologist who knows quite a bit about this asteroid. And by the way, it has a name. It's, it's the asteroid, it's called Baptistina. Baptistima? Wow. Why? That's Stina. Baptistina, I don't know. Oh. They, they name asteroids. On another subject, we do know that the Earth's moon was probably produced by a collision with something the size of Mars. Whoa. I just threw that in because it's cool. It doesn't really relate we to our story. We don't have 
the whole evening here. Let's just stay Fine. to it, okay? In any case, the dinosaurs are here on Earth. They're eating their leaves. Meanwhile, up in space, our asteroid Baptistina is now hurtling towards the Earth. 20,000 miles an hour. Very fast. 20 times faster than a very fast rifle bullet. And scientists couldn't be sure what would happen, mathematically, I mean, when an, a Mount Everest-sized bullet traveling at 20,000 miles an hour hits our atmosphere. The atmosphere is really just a very, very thin skin over the rest of the Earth. And it's a skin made of gas. So, scientists thought, all right, if we're going to construct this story, let's just take it piece by piece and first figure out what would happen when this big ball hurling through space slams into our atmosphere, which is made of gas, of course. So just to approximate, let's fire a bullet through some gas and watch what happens. So that's what you're about to see, although not quite. This is actually a gun that's going to fire a bullet through some water instead of gas, but it's going to make the point we want to make just fine. So. Uh, here's what you see. When you pull the trigger, Keith, if you would, you see the bullet coming out and freeze it right there at the edge. Okay. Basically what you see is this bullet steaming through the water, creating a wake behind it. And the wake gets wider and wider as it trails away from the bullet. And if you imagine this shape in three dimensions, really what you're looking at is a kind of a cone, like a funnel shape. And inside the, 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 the walls of the funnel, inside that cone, is nothing. 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 Well, cause, because it's in water, so you're saying there's, there's, it's like a hole in the water. That's what I'm saying. There's nothing in there. It's a uh, vacuum in there because the, the bullet is, sh is shooting through the water. It pushes the water out of the way, and for a beat, the water doesn't have time to come back together, and so huh. all you have is emptiness in there. Right. And that creates a kind of an interesting visual situation, which I'll talk about in a second. But just since we have it here... Uh, this video here, and we never really get to look at stuff on the radio. Yeah, that's um, true. Let's just play it forward, Keith, if you don't mind. Let's just look at it for a second, because it's really cool. Look what happens. The thing expands, mm -hmm. and then the vacuum, thump, collapses, and then it bounces back, and expands again, and then pow. Does this have anything to do with our subject? Just, I'm just asking. No, technically well, no. No, no you, you can't. All right, so to... just uh, rewind it back right. if you would. Okay, fine. So right there. Simple point is this. Right there, this, what you're seeing is a massive hole in the water created by a tiny little bullet. Now imagine that that bullet is six miles wide and the hole that it's making is right above your head. Well, what does that mean if you're a dinosaur looking up? What would happen? Well, if you were in the right place, and, and this is going to be the wrong place in a second or two, <laughs> but if you were in the right place to, to look behind the asteroid as it came in, you'd probably be able to, to see clearly through the space. What? Does that mean you would suddenly be looking at a nighttime hole in a daytime sky? Right. Whoa. So this is uh, Keith's in the moment approximation. To be fair, Jay did tell us that um, you would need special kinds of eyeballs to see this uh, night hole in the day sky, which the dinos did not have. But whatever. <laughs> Science! <laughs> I mean, still, just imagine, like, what a last image that would be to see day and night come together in the same moment. But, according to Jay... You better not blink, because before you could open your eyes again... the asteroid would have hit the surface. And if you're in a position to, to see that, then you're going to be engulfed by the violence that is just about to occur. So we know it was a big explosion, fine. That it was violent, fine. But I think we should be a little bit subtle about this because obviously if an asteroid is the size of Manhattan and it lands on your head, you're not going to feel very good about that. But if Manhattan is, is hitting the planet Earth, that's a little bit like a pebble hitting an enormous beach ball, right? So yeah, and I can imagine that the, the little pebble size, relativistically speaking, the pebble would create some damage in the spot where it landed. Right, but let's suppose that you are um, a leaf-eating mother of three hadrosaur living in New Zealand, right? And you're just, sp at the moment that the asteroid comes in, you're on the, you're antipodal, you're on the other side of the planet, okay? Would you have any idea that this was happening? Well, that was the next question that we took to Jay. How much damage would this thing actually do? Well, we, we can do experiments. 
we can produce things, situations like this in small quantities in the laboratories. Okay, you're all set in there? Which brings us... Yeah, we're, we're good to hear. You're good? To this guy. Uh, Peter Schultz, and I like to do impact experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Pete Schultz basically has every 13-year-old's dream job. He gets to blow shit up for a living. Basically what Pete does is he works at this place you're seeing. This is the NASA Ames Laboratory in California where they get to work, you see them putting it together here, they get to work with a giant three-story tall cannon. So what Pete does is he takes projectiles. So for example, you're gonna see him take a little glass bullet over there and he's gonna load it into the top of the cannon and then he's gonna fire it right into a stand-up for planet Earth, which for him will be a sand pit. And lucky for us, when we called Pete, he was just about to pull the trigger on this thing. So you're, we're calling you on a day in which you are trying to re-experience the day? Actually, yeah, but I think we're gonna survive. That's our plan. Navigated <laughs> and reset. Okay, hold on, we gotta, we gotta assume the position. We have to cross <laughs> our fingers. Okay, here we go, we got Here we go, here we go. We have all of our ready lights. Battle's in. Here we go. Rolling. Oh, good. That is gorgeous. That, that oh my gosh. Are they gonna, is that, you have to get I, instant playback? What, what just that, happened? <laughs> oh, oh, oh my gosh. That is the sound of a man very happy with his explosion. You can see every piece of this, uh, of what's happening. So based on experiments like this, people like Pete can figure out precisely what happened when the asteroid hit the Earth. They can quantify the explosion's power by basically leveraging up experiments like this. So according to Doug, the amount of energy that would have been unleashed when that thing came rushing in onto Earth is roughly this. It would hit the Earth with an explosion that's 100 million megatons. <laughs> Sarah Lipstay, don't look at her wrong or she'll do that to you. Okay, so here's essentially how Doug broke that down for us. Two tons of TNT, we're talking tons here, not megatons, two tons of TNT will essentially do this. Two tons of TNT will take down a building. Now, 15,000 tons of TNT, that is what the United States dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. That chaos is 15,000 tons of TNT. Now these days, according to Doug Robertson, a hydrogen bomb. What, what does that even mean? Current hydrogen bombs are typically of the order of one million tons of TNT equivalent. Now, one million tons of TNT equivalent, that's what we call a megaton. And if you remember, Doug said that the asteroid impact was the equivalent of 100 million megatons. So really what he's saying in concrete terms is that that impact was the equivalent of 100 million of those bombs going off all at once in the same spot. Which is a lot. That is true, that is true. Yeah. However, it, mean, it's, it, it really depends on what you mean by a lot. Because I was doing a little Googling and I was surprised to learn that uh, 110 million megatons is not nearly enough to destroy the planet. To destroy the entire planet, you would need, you ready for this? 110 quadrillion megatons of TNT, which is 100 million times 110 million megatons of TNT. So going back to your hadrosaur situation, mother of three mm -hmm. in New Zealand, if the thing came in antipodal to her in Mexico, maybe she would feel the ground shake a little bit, but after a minute she'd be like, whatever, and she'd go back to eating leaves. She probably wouldn't notice it. No, because that's not what we were taught in homeroom by Mrs. McGrew, or whoever your teacher was. Here is the classic explanation. Uh, this is what we were told. There was an impact, of course, and it kicked up an enormous amount of dust. You'll remember this. The dust then kind of covers the planet. It blankets the Earth, makes the Earth very cold, makes the Earth very nasty. All the big plants die, the little plants get sick, the dinosaurs get hungry, the dinosaurs get sick, and then gradually, you know, they get dead. Um, this takes a long time, and so they, you know, they have the sneezes, the influenza, the falling off the cliffs, and then they have 
you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, like, you know, 100,000 years later, you have fewer, and then like a million years later, you get the last one. <laughs> and then, boom, and it's all cold and slow. And so you're saying that the, the, the classic explanation is it was a slow, yeah. wintry, dreary like, end. Like, uh, like that, yeah. 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 I, I, I do remember that from Homeroom. Yeah. But no, no, no. You know, why would we tell these good people that tired old tale? Let's actually flip the understanding completely. I think we should. Based on uh, new science. So, all right, here's what we're going to do. Keith, if you would, rewind. Uh, take that ballistics video with the pink sand that we showed earlier from Pete Schultz's lab. Let's blow that up here and then rewind all the way back. Uh, yes, wait, wait, back a little bit more. Back to the beginning. Okay, there we go. So this is a 6,000 frame a second video uh, that, was, that Pete shot in his lab. Now, in the first few frames, you see the laser slamming into the sand, and then the next thing, you see a big flash, and then, advance it, wait, there we go, you see some fire. Now, Pete and people like him can measure the temperature at that little spot right there, that bulb of fire right near the impact. Yes, that right there. Uh, they can measure the temperature of that spot. And just to state the obvious, we know from those measurements at that spot, it would have gotten very, 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 very hot. You know, way beyond the temperature of the, the sun. I mean, we're talking temperatures maybe 20,000 degrees. Whoa. The sun's temperature is about 5,000 degrees. And if we're talking temperatures four times hotter than the sun, well, anything that's that hot is going to instantly, instantly turn to gas. A very, very high temperature, high pressure gas. It's actually rock vapor, rock steam. So imagine, this thing comes barreling in, this asteroid. It doesn't just bounce off the Earth, it plows into the Earth. It goes into the surface, two miles in, five miles in, seven miles in, 10 miles in, 20 miles into the Earth it goes. All the rock that it's plowing into is turning into a liquid and then into a gas. And now, watch what happens next. This is a basic physics experiment we're going to show you. We turned it on its side. This is just a dude dropping a ball in some sand. Watch this right here. <laughs> Does this always happen, this, whatever this is? Yeah, it's like Newton's law of something. Yeah. <laughs> Newton's law of sand, okay. we'll say. No, but what you see is you see this bounce back effect, this little plume, this fine plume of sand goes shooting back in the opposite direction as a sort of rebound, right? Mm. Now imagine that that ball is an asteroid, and that sand over there, that's the planet Earth. So Keith, play that one more time. Thank you for those sounds. So well, you would get the same effect. You would get the... <laughs> the simple point is... It's just something we do. <laughs> you wonder where we get all of our sound design? It's out of that man's <laughs> mouth. That's where. So you would get that same bounce back effect of a fine plume shooting back in the opposite direction. But we know, from what we just heard uh, uh, Doug describe, that it would, not be it would not be sand in this case. It would be rock gas. This plume of hot gas expands upward and pushes right on through the atmosphere, up into space. Some fraction hit the moon. Really? Okay. Some fraction of that hit Mars. Okay, so now you got this sneeze of rock vapor. It's out in space. Basic physics says that as it travels out farther away from the Earth, what's going to happen is it's going to go from hot to it's going to start to cool down a bit. And when it cools... It recondenses into little droplets that uh, basically form glass very quickly. Little droplets of glass about the size of sand. Now, if you look at one of these little droplets of glass under a microscope, this is what it looks like right there. That is actually a, a magnified image of one of these bits of glass that fell from space that day. Most of them didn't land on the ground. I'll talk about that in a second. But there it is. I don't know about you, but I find that totally terrifying. Because that's... It looks like a little Baptistina, right? Tiny little asteroid. Except now imagine trillions of these things in a cloud, in a cloud of shrapnel, go, you know, going out, 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 away from the Earth. And what's going to happen next is that it's going to start to lose momentum, that cloud. And when it does, the Earth's gravity is going to grab back hold of it and say, come on back. And 90% of them come back to the Earth. 
Well, does falling glass do harm? Yes, because what happens is that the, the glass out in space starts to spread out like north and south and east and west, and eventually it will appear in the sky over New Zealand. You know? So that hadrosaur will be seeing... That's these, right. Yeah. It's now a global phenomenon. And, you know, it's really hard to imagine what the hadrosaur would have seen, but the thing to keep in mind is that these things as they're coming in, these bits of glass, 90-some-odd uh, percent are burning up in the atmosphere. So very few of them are hitting the ground. So from her point of view, probably it would have looked like the greatest meteor shower anyone has ever seen. With one significant bummer, which is this. When these little bits of glass come in, each one that burns up is depositing a little bit of heat into the sky. And collectively, there's such a massive rain of these things coming in. Well? Well, the heat would build up. The sky would turn red. It would be getting hotter and hotter. And at a certain point, Jay wondered, well, how hot exactly would it have gotten? Like, how much heat exactly would have built up there in the sky and then started to radiate down? Um, <clears throat> we uh, calculated the amount of heat that would come down, we, a, a number, 10 kilowatts per square meter. And yeah, okay, well, we get this number. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, I, I went home and I um, hooked up a, a, a current meter and tried to measure the amount of heat produced in my oven for different amounts of power. And I could get about seven kilowatts per square meter in my oven on broil. And oh, like 500 degrees broil, you yeah. mean? But that wasn't quite enough. Not nearly. So Jay started measuring other kinds of ovens. Uh, and I, I finally found out that the heat would be, in fact, like being in a pizza oven. A pizza oven is about right. Which means that if you were a terrestrial dinosaur anywhere above the ground on the Earth on that day, you would have experienced some heat that is almost unimaginable. Maybe it started at 100 degrees because it was June, it was summer, but within minutes it would have been 300 degrees, 500 degrees, 700 degrees, 900 degrees, Estimates are on that day, temperatures topped out at something like 1,200 degrees. At that temperature, nothing can protect you. Your scales, your fur, whatever you got, it's not going to do any good. Your blood will literally start to boil inside your body, and you will die. So essentially, according to this theory, the dinosaurs and everything else on Earth that day would have been incinerated. Doug thinks that's what did them in, not so much the impact, but all that ejecta that went up into the sky, came down as glass rain and created that heat. That's what did them in. And he would argue it didn't just do some of them in, or even many of them in. He would say it did all of them in, all at once. There is zero evidence that any dinosaur made it through. And the crazy part of this theory is that Jay and Doug think that the whole process, from the impact to the glass rain to the incineration of all of these species on the planet... It would have taken a few hours. His best guess, he thinks, maybe two hours. I mean, that's less time than a, a business lunch. Yeah, you try getting east, north, west, anywhere on Mercer Street at rush hour in two hours... Can't do that. Hmm. I mean, if you think about it, that is less time than you will spend in this theater tonight.
That means that you're saying that an animal that had been supreme on the planet for 200 million years disappears in a few hours completely? Yes. Yep. That's what the evidence suggests. That's right. Well, you can consider the evidence, but also you could consider common sense. I mean, we've got a world filled with terrestrial dinosaurs. They were on every continent. They were even in Antarctica. And to say that they all disappeared in two hours, I mean, all, that would, that suggests that there's none of them in out of harm's way, none of them in a cave somewhere, none of them in a grotto, none of them in a, in a protected forest of any kind. I mean, the word all in that connection is just too much. Uh, I just don't buy it. Well, yeah, I mean, the truth is that the science is never going to be so uh, exact as to say, yeah, all of them disappeared, or it happened on a single day or on an afternoon. I mean, no, no tool that we have is that precise. But what Jay is saying is that it happened fast, very fast, nothing made it through. But what I find interesting is that ultimately, you don't need the ballistics or anything we've shown you so far to know that something major and sudden happened because you can see evidence of it literally etched into the earth. So, here's the spot where we first found the Kitty Boundary. You can see it really well out in Colorado, actually. We sent uh, one of our producers, Molly Webster, out there to meet a paleontologist named Kirk Johnson. They hiked over a couple of hills. They found this one specific spot. I'm like ready for a dinosaur to come around the corner. And... A new minute. They started to dig. Turns out, for every three feet, you get down 10,000 years in time. See, the Earth has layers, kind of like a tree has rings. And every three feet down you go, you're going back in time about 10,000 years. And when you go all the way down, all the way back, to 66.09 million years, you will find this one little skinny strip of rock. Okay. That's the kitty gun. This one skinny gray line. This, this gray, crappy... Oh, that! This. Now, in a very real way, that line that you're seeing, that represents the day the asteroid hit. The day. And just above that line... That's a little bit after the day. And just below that line... is a little bit before the day. The line is called the KT boundary. And what's cool is you can actually touch it. You can touch evidence of that moment. And in fact, Kirk, what he did that day was he took his finger and he dug a piece out and he handed it to Molly. This, we're hold, I'm holding you're the holding, KT. <laughs> you're holding the KT boundary. It's like, uh, it's almost like chunks of coal. Yeah, but it's not. What yeah. you're holding is a dark gray mudstone. It's a carbon-rich mudstone. And in that mudstone, you'll find all kinds of things. I mean, you'll find uh, very rare minerals like iridium that probably came in on the asteroid and got smushed into that line. Those little glass balls I was talking about, those little hell balls, well, if you get out a microscope and you look at that rock, you will see them in there. <laughs> They're all in that line. How thick do you think that line is? That's about an inch. Is, like, hidden in there is sort of the story of that day. Absolutely. And here's the crazy thing. If this is the line right here, this little strip here, and then you dig just below the line, you are going to find over and over again dinosaurs everywhere. I mean, they're not going to be alive, of course, although I'm giving them a certain amount of energy, which I shouldn't, but uh, they're fossils. And you will find dinosaur fossils from Europe and Idaho and Montana. This one says it was made in China. But <laughs> if you just go above the line, you don't find any dinosaurs. So below the line, scientists have looked everywhere above the line. And they haven't, well, they, everywhere they have looked anyway, they found nothing, nothing, nothing. It's, it's a different world. That's the amazing thing. It's a different world. And it's pretty rare you can go, this is one world and that's another world. You're literally just pointing pinky to pointer finger spread. Yeah.
Apocalypse brought to you by Sarah Lipstay from the Junction Dare Brave! Oh, I was feeling that one. All right, so let's just talk about the next question that uh, got us kind of interested. This is sort of the obvious next question, uh, which is what made it through and how? Well, we did ask scientists that question, and here is what they told us. If on that day you were a creature in the ocean and you happened to be within 300 feet of the water surface, so if you imagine this room, filled with ocean water. We're talking about you guys up in the balcony. Up there, it will not surprise you to learn. You don't do very well. Uh, there's a certain amount of heat, and mostly there's acid rain pouring in, so a lot of you will die. But down with the higher paying seats, if you're below 300 feet, and this always happens to people with the, you know, with the better, anyway, you do fine. And on land, it turns out, plain ordinary dirt is a very good insulator. Mm -hmm. If you've got 1,200 degrees on the surface, then about um, three, four inches down, you would be comfortable there for several hours. Oh, oh, just a couple inches. You only need a few inches. So that means you could be a little worm, and if you squiggle down, you're okay. You could be a beetle squiggling down, you're okay. You could be a dinosaur tending to an underground nest, and if the nest is far enough below the, the ground, and a lot of them were, then the babies that hatch will have babies that hatch, will have babies that hatch, we will call their babies years later birds. And if you're an early version of a crocodile and you bury yourself deep enough into the mud, you also get through, as do the plants, roots, and many of the, a lot gets through actually. And that actually brings us to uh, what I find to be one of the coolest parts of the story. This is the part that involves all of us in this room. So it turns out on that day, as the fire was raging above on the surface, somewhere in a little hole in the ground happened to be a furry little animal. It has the distinction of being the great, 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 all of a sudden, it was just you and me. Yeah, though. No. Um, <laughs> there was a creature down there uh, in, uh, in, in a little hole. And when the dinosaurs got cleared away, this creature could step out of her hole. She could step out of her niche. She had more food, more places to roam. She could populate the planet, ushering in the age of mammals. And now here we all are in Seattle. <laughs> oh, don't flatter yourself. <laughs> it's not a straight line. It's a wiggly line. It's a wiggly line. But here's the problem. We've never known anything about this animal that gave rise to all of us. We've never known what she looked like. We've never known, uh, you know, how she spent her days. We've never known anything, because we've had no fossils of her. But recently, actually literally as we were reporting this story, right in the middle of our reporting, uh, a team of scientists led by a woman named Maureen O'Leary, who is herself a mammal, mm -hmm. she took uh, fossils that we do have, fossils of this creature's descendants, and then using fancy algorithms was able to cross-reference the traits to work her way back for the first time to a composite picture of what we think our great-great-grandma looked like. So now, Seattle, a Radio Lab exclusive, we present to you our great-great-great-great-etc-grandma! <laughs> All right, well, this is what she looked like, and I want to just point out a few features about this enticing uh, animal. First of all, the scientists have pointed out she has very fleshy ears. I'm not sure why that's important, but they do think so. They find that her pale underbelly is worth mentioning. It's soft and, and very, very nice to stroke. She, could you just show them your, your profile, just the profile of your thank you? It's either rat-like or crocodilian you choose, but it does feature big, beautiful, beady black eyes, a fleshy pink nose, and especially a nice, could you show them your teeth? 
Just let them see. These are teeth that can tear flesh or tear lettuce. She is an omnivore. But here is a, here was the issue, at least initially. When we asked Maureen, uh, we were like, this is, she's the scientist who did this work. We said, okay, look, we have this, this, this image of this creature for the first time. That's amazing. What do we call her? What is her name? <laughs> this was Maureen's response. Its official name is the hypothetical placental mammal. What kind of a name is that? I'm suddenly feeling bad for this little creature. <laughs> well, it's not something that we thought of as we were sort of busily working on the paper. But then a, a funny thing happened. Our producer, Molly, was talking to Maureen, and she was saying, gee, this is such an awful name. And, and Maureen says to Molly, well, you could name it. And Molly says to Maureen, oh, wait, are you serious? And Maureen says to Molly, I don't know. Are you serious? So... We're like, hell yeah, we're serious. Let's crowdsource this, right? This is what mammals do these days, we crowdsource. I mean, think of this opportunity. A little radio show gets to name the ancestor of us all. So we put out the call to the internet. We got a thousand submissions in response. Great names, like Placentor. Placentor. First. First. F-U-R-S-T, Nova. N-O-V-A. And after eight rounds of voting, the winning name was Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> Schrodinger. I can't even describe what a dark night of the soul this was for the staff. I mean, this whole experience made us wonder, should we have died in that asteroid? <laughs> Do we deserve to be here? So, if you're asking yourself what is the moral of our story, here's what we've shown you. We, we have a big, mighty species that died, and then a smaller species, which is you and I, we take its place. So you've gotten death, and you've gotten resurrection, and you got it maybe in a single afternoon, so that's the argument we're making here. This is Jay Malosh's argument that it was boom, over. I mean, it is the suddenness of, of the whole over that is kind of unimaginable. I mean, like, there you are one day, you have evolved over millions of years to be this long-necked, beautiful creature, 70 feet from your nose to your ass. And tail, then, tail. Or tail. And then in an afternoon, like on one Tuesday afternoon, suddenly you, everyone you knew, gone. 100 million years out like a candle. Life will bounce back, of course, it always does, but you don't. No, you can't. You know, you, everything you were, have been erased. Except for this, that millions of years later, when the mammals that replace you find your bones buried in some rocks and they reconstruct you and draw pictures of you, then the littlest mammals, in the form of three-year-old boys and girls, they start to dream about you and they get frightened by you. And in their way, they bring you back because in their heads, you are huge again. You are powerful again. And you're adorable again. You're sometimes scary again. Always majestic. But you know, then those kids grow up. You go to school. They visit museums where you're a fossil. And when you're a fossil, let's face it, you, you must be dead again. And that's your fate. You were killed on a real afternoon 66 million years ago. And then, in a way, you were killed over and over and over and over again in those years between ages 3 and 13. So dinosaurs never stop dying. But on the other hand, on the other hand, they're always here.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, for so many years, I, um, I just, I was just really excited to be a part of a radio show that had so much to do with music. And, um, oh, you know, <laughs> Here we are, you know, it's hard to imagine, but um, I sure the paramount, um, so. Uh, anyway, I want to do a, a small song for you guys tonight. This is, a, this is one of my favorite songs that I've done. Um, it's a very special one for you guys, because it's very so sweet. <laughs> so. I hope that you enjoy it. Um, this is um, a new uh, sound garden um, of the new sound garden EP. Uh, it's called a uh, Dirty Mother Finger. Thank you very much. Uh, for my next number, this is a, this is a, tends to be the moment where we think back on um, the early elements of uh, jazz in our society and our culture and how that influenced and formed uh, uh, the current state of music as it is um, uh, now. Uh, that's why I use the, the word current, but I... Um, I'm very pleased to announce uh, this, is a, this is an old song. This is a Billy Strayhorn uh, tune that a lot of people don't know. So I'm going to do this uh, Strayhorn tune uh, for you guys here this evening. I know a lot of you guys um, are big, big fans of, of some Billy Strayhorn. And, um, so I want to give it to you straight and want to give it to you hard. Um, <laughs> But, but we don't want to give it to you too hard, you know, just want to imply that that is a possibility and <laughs> use that as a weapon to subvert expectation. Okay. And 
Segunda vez a ser a feira Sara, 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 KMS 105 KMS 105 KMS 105 Condenser Condenser microphone Yeah yeah, yeah. KMS 105 I'm going to do, I, I'm a big fan of covers, and so I'm going to be doing a cover of an old, this is an old uh, uh, Seattle or Northwest based um, hip hop artist uh, that became iconic in the early 90s, and it's a song called uh, My Pussy's on Broadway. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my posse's, my posse's on Broadway. pleasure uh, to be a part of, uh, of the radio um, ecology and um, and I do attempt just so you guys know I do attempt to use phasing uh, as much as possible and uh, what I mean by that is uh, when you're using one uh, microphone sound source like the one I'm using right now with the KMS 105 condenser microphone from Neumann um, uh, and then decide to switch to the Beta SM58, uh, like this one, um, you can get them close together, and when you get them close together, you start having some phasing issues. So I'm going to just show you real quick right now how it sounds this way, because you have two sound sources kind of coming into each other, plus the added effect of a monitor, which is also picking up uh, the phasing that's happening between these two sound uh, sources. Um, so I just want to let you know about that. Um, okay. So for my last song this evening. Um, uh, this is, uh, absolutely, Seattle in the house. Seattle. Everyone I say, what I mean. Okay, 
All right, here we go. So this is, this is the last song. This is, a, this is a song about radio, how it's important and how um, we need to uh, you know, be aware of it a little bit more than we are. And, and thankfully, all of you guys in here are aware of it, and that's very important. So um, this is a song that celebrates uh, radio and that medium which is most endearing and appropriate to our oral traditions. Thank you. or many subdivisions between the categories of human beings. Oh yeah, maybe it doesn't matter, but if you put yourself on that poo-poo platter, you gotta understand that selection is the key to life, to life, to life, to life, yeah. too excited you know what happens so you've got to tuck it tuck it tuck it away under the belt between the thing oh yeah and if you get excited too 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 excited take some ice cubes and throw them down there take some ice cubes and throw them down there yeah so ladies all you got to use is to strategically place pieces of tape on your body and that will mass excitement very easily, yeah. Whoa, yeah, yeah. But baby, I don't. Thank you so much, guys. Have a, have a great evening. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Reggie Woods! Oh my God, did that just happen? <laughs> what? That was amazing. 
Oh my goodness, before we get back on our endings train, we just, I, just need to, I just need to appreciate what just happened just now. I also want to pick up on something that, uh, that Reggie just said. He's, uh, the, the, uh, okay, so this is a show about endings ostensibly, but really it's a show about appreciating this moment. Not pawning the moment off on a moment broker, but appreciating this moment. So I want to actually, uh, I want to, if you guys will help me do some appreciation right now. Let's get back our, uh, our four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, Keith Scratch on the video, Darren Gray, the Miley Cyrus of the bass, Glenn Kochi, the harbinger of things to drum, and Sarah Lipstate, Lightning Lipstate on the guitar. Show these folks some love. Also, uh, I want to appreciate our fifth horseman, Reggie Watts. My God, that was amazing. Also, our sixth horseman, Kurt Brownoller, for opening it up for us tonight. He's got a CD that's for sale out there. Also, a couple other people I want to thank before we, we roll on. Mr. Myron Gousseau, our fantastically talented puppeteer. Myron, get your ass out here. Also, the puppets that were provided to us from an Australian company called Earth. Thank you to them for, for shipping those puppets all the way across the ocean so they could be with us here. They will have a show called Dinosaur Zoo, which will be touring soon. Definitely check them out. And also, I want to thank two, two unsung heroes of this show, the dudes who designed everything that you're seeing up here. They designed the set. They built this Paleolithic situation right behind us. Uh, Josh Higginson, Austin Schweitzer from the team Workhorse in Brooklyn. Guys, get out here and take a bow. I mean, it, it is a little unusual how much you can do with toy dinosaurs and a flashlight. I mean, it's kind of amazing. I yeah, think. absolutely. All right, so I think that I, that's, I think I, I didn't forget anyone. If I did, I'll thank him later. All right, so let's see. Let's just take stock for a second, Robert. We did our super fast radical dino ending. Reggie did his Reggie ending. Which, which you're never quite sure what he's saying, you know? I, it, can Doesn't you matter. imagine? We have scripts and everything. Imagine if I just went to you. <laughs> All evening long. It would, that would be, be outer oh, space, I man. Know. Well, okay, so what's, ne what's next? What's, what's uh, our next we're ending? Gonna, we're ready for the pink ending now. The, the pink, pink ending. You mean like the color? Well, yeah, this is the one that answers, I think, the most basic question you could ask in a show like this. This asks, when did endings begin? It's a serious question. That's a weird one. When did endings begin? Wouldn't there always, a, I mean, the moment you had beginnings, wouldn't that then imply an end? Because the beginnings have to do something. End. You'd think so. But if you think hard about the origin of the universe, I would propose that when the universe began, which by some interpretation was a huge explosion of energy, which then condensed and cooled into matter, that that whole event came in without any notion of endings at all. Huh. Yeah. Um, so when you get matter, when you get that condensation, you get a list of elements, which we can now turn to in the periodic table of elements with which you are, I'm sure, very familiar and enjoy every evening before dining or sleeping. <laughs> so if we, if we look at this, at this chart, and we start up in the upper left-hand side with hydrogen, and we move through it to helium and lithium and beryllium and boron and carbon and on and on, as we move through the list, I can tell you that every one of the first 82 elements on this chart, with two exceptions, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, every one of these has a version of itself that goes on forever and ever and ever until the end of time. So every one of these ones we're seeing right here that are colored in, every one of these is immortal? Is that what you're saying? Mm, yeah, well, I guess you could call it immortal. I mean, you choose any one. Uh, choose gold, for example. Ooh, look at you. Could you do that? Well, so this is a gold atom. It was spurt out of a star, right? Okay. And it will keep company with other atoms from time to time, but basically it will go on till the end of time, or there's a version of it that will. Wow. Now, uh, what I would tell you is that when you go back to the chart to the end of our little group there, to the first one on the next in the black, called B or bismuth, bismuth, I would argue, is where the universe invented endings. And what is bismuth? It's a gas? No, no, it's a rock. It's a shiny, beautiful black rock, actually. And yeah. you're saying this shiny, beautiful rock is the beginning of death? 
Yes, yes, I would say that. That's a fair approach. Why would that be? Well, because all the atoms at the bottom of this chart are a little heavier than the ones at the top, meaning they have more neutrons and protons than the early. Like, for example, look here is our version of bismuth. It has lots and lots of, of neutrons and protons. And there's so many of them, as you can see, they're having a little trouble holding their, themselves together. They do look a little uh, tense. French scientists studying this atom recently determined that inevitably, inevitably, something will happen to this atom. It goes something like this. Whoa. I <laughs> you timed that we, so I well. I know, it's we tried. Do that again, do that again. Okay, I don't know if I can do it twice. Well, no, you don't add sound effects. I can do the sound effects and you do the... Okay. That's one more time. Oh, now you're like going on strike? No, well, the you point... You made him angry. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> All right. The, the point I'm trying to make, Keith, is that this atom, when it loses protons, it loses its identity. When an atom decays, it, this atom is no longer bismuth if it doesn't have the right number of protons. That's the way chemistry works. So you're works. saying like, as, it, as it sheds its protons and neutrons, it's dying. That's, That's right. right. Now, here's the cool thing. When we go back to the chart, to number 83, Every element after it, po, at, run, fur, ra, rif, dib, sig, bu, s, mit, dis, and rig, also decay. So, so all these yellow ones are, are, all, are, are the dyers, and the other ones we met earlier, those are the stayers? That's correct, that's correct. But with, the, with the two exceptions I mentioned, I should say, 43 and 61, that's technetium and promethium. Nobody really likes those two. Um, <laughs> they're... They've decayed from early for mm -hmm. a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, I don't much care for them. I find you. them actually unnecessary. I tell you what, if they, if they mess up the whole logic here, let's, just, let's just get rid of them. Let's get rid of them. Get, out, get them out of here. <laughs> All right. But the weird irony is, oh, let me just say, when we've divided up like this, now you can see that bismuth is at the dividing line maybe of the universe, because this is like, this is where you see, it's like the KT boundary with the dinosaurs. This is a, this is a, but for everything. For everything. Huh. But the cu cool thing is, bismuth is pretty good for you. Really? Like people swallow little bits of bismuth every time they get tummy aches. They do this all the time. You recognize this color, maybe? Yes. The pink I mentioned? Yeah. Huh? Do you recognize the product associated with this color? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pepto B. Well, you don't say B. Say the whole first syllable Pepto. of the second word. Biz? Biz. biz, biz, biz. Why? What do you mean, why? Do you bis saying, are you saying that bismuth, you're saying that bismol is for bismuth? No, I'm saying bismuth is in bismol. There's no, little, man, there's little black rocks in there. There are. No, I don't, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Well, what do you think? Well, I think that bis if I had to guess, I would say Bismol is just the guy's name, like the guy who invented Pepto-Bismol, like that guy, Fred Bismol. No, that, name. that guy it seems to have a toothache. He's in the wrong ad. I don't know how... No, and, and you, what did you tell me earlier, that it's a black rock? Yeah, yeah. It's a pink liquid. No, it, it, there are black rocks in that pink liquid. You don't believe me, do no, you? No, oh, well, Can I just prove this to you? Yeah, prove Let it. me prove it to you prove right it. now. Whoa. Hi. Oh, yeah, it's, it's me, Robert, again. I am, we're, Gail, where am I? Are we? You're at the Berkeley Carroll High School in Brooklyn, New York. And we're in a real, fully equipped chemistry lab, and Gail's going to show us what you claim not to believe. That's right? right. So how do we start? With this. Oh, yeah. We take 11 tablets of Pepto-B, that's 9, 10, 11, put them into a bowl, we pound. Next, we measure out some water and add hydrochloric acid, even though it's corrosive to body tissue. Now add powder, stir, stand back. Oh boy. And now we put in a little strip of aluminum foil. What's gonna happen is the aluminum is gonna dissolve into the acid and chemically, it'll spit the bismuth out. Now Jad, prepare to be astounded. They're gonna watch little bits of rock falling out of the liquid. That's bismuth. And here's an even better shot, courtesy of photographer Melanie Hoff. Wow. Jed, look, you can't deny scientific fact that hiding inside every single Pepto-Bismol tablet is pure, street-level grade, crystal bismuth. <laughs> that's that's yeah, bismuth. Yeah, Robert, show, show them in the bismuth. So that Robert wants me to show you. See these shiny black rocks? These, came, these precipitated out of a bottle 
of Pepto wow. B, isn't no it? Kidding. And if you want to see the atom in, in grand magnification, just look up. That's it looks a little bit like a Mayan temple on hallucinogens, but that's what bismuth is. It's cool looking. It, it is. If you but if you let's go back to the to the periodic table one last time because here's the best thing about bismuth really, it lives in a very poisonous to people neighborhood. Like Keith, could you just go find bismuth again? It's 83. On the, yeah, mm, yeah. Now we'll go next door to Pub. Pub is lead. You don't give lead to a three-year-old and say suck on this, right? No, because they get definitely not. Right. That's a poison. You go next door to 81. That's thallium. The CIA decided to sprinkle thallium on Fidel Castro's beard, knowing that it's a defoliator, so it would make his beard fall off, thereby taking his machismo and basically causing a revolution. They were hoping for a revolution from thallium. Did it work? It was a good plan. The execution was a little rough. They couldn't get the thallium on the beer. Huh. But if you go over to the right, past B to Po, go to Po, yeah, polonium. The Russians didn't like a guy at all. He was having sushi in London one day. They sprinkled the polonium on the sushi. He ate the sushi and he died. Wow. That's, it's that poisonous. No kidding. Yeah. What, so this is a treacherous little neighborhood it, right very here. Very treacherous. I mean, you got, starting with thallium, you got poison, poison, Pepto-B, poison. Right. <laughs> and in the middle of a poisonous neighborhood, you have an element that cures tummy aches. I mean, and really. apparently introduces death to the universe. Exactly. It's the best element ever. It's really, I think we should have a toast to bismuth. Seven toast. To bismuth. To bismuth. So you may be wondering, was that a covert attempt to market for Pepto-Bismol? The answer is no. But if you're out there, Pepto-B, give us a call. Give us a call. You are such a slut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to close the show. We're going to shift the mood a bit. We're going to close out this show and our tour with a very different kind of ending. Yeah, because unlike dinosaurs, you know, dinosaurs have no idea what's ever going to happen to them. But in this story, we have an ending in which the Enders can see what's coming. It's coming right at them. Not fast, but in this case, very slowly. Uh -uh. Agonizingly slowly. So can you guys hear me easily? easily. Yes. Easily. Okay, good. We want to introduce you to two guys. Their names are Chris Jones and Dan Moran. They're both actors in Manhattan. Both been doing it. About 30, 40 years. 30, 40 years. Plays, movies, you name it. Done uh, five Woody Allen films. Body Gosler's Pantomime Circus. Julius Caesar on Broadway with Denzel. Moonstruck. The Cher movie? Yeah. A lot of Shakespeare, a lot of comedies. They've worked pretty much everywhere there is to work. As it happens, I know this story because Chris, one of the actors, is an old friend we met in a high school musical, actually, many years ago. Oklahoma? You think everything is Oklahoma. I don't know. I don't know it, musicals. It, anything goes. Okay. In any case, our story for both Chris and Dan begins... Ten years ago. Dan was on stage, big stage, Washington, D.C. I was doing Streetcar. As in Streetcar Named Desire, and he was playing the lead role, Stanley Kowalski. You know, the guy that Marlon Brando made famous for yelling? Hey, Stella! That guy? And, uh... The, uh woman playing Stella said it's really sexy how your left arm doesn't swing when you walk. It's kind of like animalistic. And I said, well, that's cool, so I used it. You thought, all right, if it works, it works. I'll just play the character that way as a guy whose arm doesn't swing. But I, after the show ended, I was walking down the streets of Manhattan, and I thought, why isn't my left arm swinging? What's going on? Now, Chris... So, right out of, around the same time, he was in Delaware shooting a film. A movie by M. Night Shyamalan. Kind of a great movie, if you ask me. Called The Village. There are marks on the door. And while getting... Adrian Brody's father. And while getting ready in wardrobe one day, he noticed... That I had a slight tremor occasionally. Difficult time 
buttoning buttons with my right hand. And uh, I thought I had a pinched nerve in my neck. And I went to see an orthopedic guy, and he said, you should see a neurologist. So I went to um, a doctor. And he said, very gleefully, I think, you've got Parkinson's. <laughs> Why? And he had to run a deficit of Parkinsonians? He was pleased that he was able to help me out. He nailed it. Now, Parkinson's. If you ask an expert, which we did. Cheryl Waters, Columbia University Medical Center. Parkinson's is a very mysterious disease. I'm not sure what to think about it now because it keeps evolving and changing. Some people, according to Dr. Waters, when they get the disease, nothing happens. Nothing. They come with tremor and they die with a little bit of tremor and nothing else ever happens. But in other cases, for some reason... It could wreak havoc. Because sometimes, and the doctors really don't know why this is the case, sometimes the disease will just start to march through the brain. It'll begin deep down. Low down in the brain stem. And then it will gradually inch its way upward. First it'll attack this little cluster of cells. In the middle of the brain that control movement. And that's when you start to see the shakes. And then little by little there's a progression. A progression up. A migration. To the surface. To other areas of the brain that control thinking, memory, concentration. And in those cases, the disease... It is inexorably progressive. So you got two basic types. But when you're diagnosed, you can never quite be sure which kind you got. The kind that's gonna stay put, do nothing, or the kind that will progressively, inexorably do you in. Because... For the people in whom it spreads, it can take decades. When he said you have Parkinson's, did you feel like you were in no. trouble at the time? No, no, that was a joke. That was a joke. This is nothing. I'm fine. In the beginning, Dan and Chris didn't really worry a whole lot about this because they didn't have to. In fact, Chris... When I first was diagnosed and was performing... He was doing a lot of Shakespeare. And, you know, if his hand ever started to, to shake a bit... It was always nice to have a nice big cloak or cape for me to wear to hide my hand behind. And he could hide it so that the audience wouldn't see the tremor. Truth is, it didn't happen all that often, wasn't much of a deal. Chris kept acting, Dan kept acting, and in both of them, their Parkinson's seemed to be the kind that stays asleep. And that's what it seemed to do for a very long time, just sleep. For two years, three years, five years, seven years. But then, after eight years, it just woke up. I just thought that it got harder and harder to move. Dan says he's not quite sure when it happened, but suddenly his limbs were aching all the time. And that easy control that you have over your body as you're walking down the street where all the limbs are moving together and you don't have to think about it. For him, that started to disappear. He'd have to think about each leg, each foot independently. Move your left, now move your right. Move your left, move your right. Chris, he would actually have these moments where he would try to move his arm, where his brain would basically say to his arm, Move! But his arm would just sit there, stuck. Like it wanted to move, but it couldn't, it just somehow couldn't. I would freeze on stage. It was a, a, a nightmare. And as things progressed, Dan would have these moments in rehearsals where suddenly he would just go blank. Like, I, I'd done this um, TV show on, on FX. I, I had one scene where I couldn't remember five lines. I just couldn't remember five lines. We shot all night on this. I'd go to my dressing room, I'd do the lines, I'd come back out, I'd blow it. Now, this isn't an easy situation for anybody, but if you're an actor, if you're somebody who has to inhabit a character, a different rhythm than yours, a different flow, use your body to do that, which is how you pay the rent. For actors, Parkinson's is just awful because it kills their craft. Well, your face becomes a mask. So you don't got your face. And without face, you don't have flow. The way I liken it, if you take a pebble and you throw it into a pool of water, it goes And there's a ripple that goes, concentric circles go out from the impact. If you take me, my body, 
myself as an actor and you throw a pebble into my pool, it goes thud. There's no fluidity, there's no, it just stops. And once I, I, I opened up to the uh, acting world that I had Parkinson's, my agents dropped me. The uh, calls pretty much stopped coming and that was that. But then one night, something happened. How did this idea come up? Well, it was my first idea, I guess. You're a brilliant idea. Thank you, buddy. And we should say that these two guys, Chris and Dan, they've actually known each other for years. The two of you met doing what? A Month in the Country. Which is a classic play. On Broadway. And Dan explains it was late one night. He was having insomnia, which is a usual side effect of the medication he has to take. And he was just looking around for something to read. And he grabs this play off the shelf. It was a play by Samuel Beckett. Endgame, a play in one act. Characters, Ham, Chloe. And he starts reading. I mean, this was a play that he knew. He had read it before. But that night, that night, it seemed to talk to him in a way that was totally new. Bare interior, gray light. Right from the start. It started off with a guy shuffling on stage. Clove goes and stands under the window left. Stiff, staggering walk, shuffling around. He looks up at window left. He turns and looks at window right. And I said, oh yeah, I, I, I know shuffling. He thought, huh, I feel this guy. Can't sit, can't get comfortable. It seemed familiar to him. And then on the next page, Ham stirs. Another guy enters the scene. Very red face, black glasses. Also in bad shape. This guy is stuck in this wheelchair, can't walk anymore. He takes off his glasses, wipes his eyes, his face, the glasses, puts them on again. So here you got these two guys. One can't sit, one can't stand. They're stuck in this little room. They've got these two little windows that look out. And outside those windows? Either due to an asteroid, a nuclear holocaust, what used to be green is now gray like a wasteland. Is there anyone alive out there, do you think? Or... No. No. Outside their window, they can see the ocean, but it seems to have stopped moving. There are no waves. Now, in game, that's a term that comes from chess, and it refers to that moment in the game when there are just a few pieces and just a few moves left. The last few moves before the inevitable outcome. It's not the end, it's the point right before the end, and it's the place where you become aware of the end for the first time. The dinosaur can't do that, but these two characters... They run out of everything, out of painkiller. Yeah, painkillers are gone. Out of biscuits. And they have that awful awareness. And now they have to deal with it. Like, here we are. What do we do? How do we fill up the time on this rock hurtling through space? The more I read it, it just felt like Parkinson's to me. Being locked in a room was my body. I'm not getting out. There's no cure. I'm not getting out of this room. And then, on page three, one of the characters, a guy named Ham, stops what he's doing and he says, Enough. It's time it ended. And yet, I hesitate. I hesitate to, to end. And Dan says something about the line, and yet I hesitate, I hesitate to, to end. Just flipped a switch for him. Well, screw these people who won't hire me. Because I've got this fucking little disease that makes me shake. Or, or talk funny. I don't need those people. No. Next morning he calls Chris. Chris, describe the call. You're sitting there and one day the phone rings. That yeah, happened. he says, how'd you like to get together and take a look at Endgame? And Chris remembers thinking, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm up to it. It's a 70 minute long play. It's got 12,000 words. The material is monumental. But they thought, no, no, let's just, no pressure. Let's just, let's just meet at each other's apartment. So one day Dan would read one part, Chris the other part. The next day they'd switch. They did this for almost a year, the two of them, in each other's living rooms, reading the play back and forth. Until finally, they contacted the Beckett estate and got permission to put on one live performance in New York. We decided Chris is having more trouble with his movement than I am. I have more trouble with my speech than Chris is. 
So I thought, well, why don't I take on the part with all the speech? And you got trouble with moving, so well, you do the part with all the movement. That makes sense. So you both leaned into your weaknesses. Yes. Well, so the, well, the obvious question is, why would two people in danger, and in more danger over time, why would you decide to spend time staring at that danger straight in the eye? Like, that's just a weird thing to do. It's the only way to do it. It's the only way to do it. And I can't, like, go through my, the rest of my life being afraid of this fucking disease. When, when he said that, I didn't quite understand what he was saying. Because if you are legitimately afraid of something, why would it make you less afraid to stare at its details? That would make me more afraid. I, mean, I don't what? know if it's about fear, really. I think it's about knowing. Knowing what? Knowing... Just knowing where you are, like where you really are, you know? It's like a kind of journalism in a way. Like I can imagine if you've got this thing that's been stealing from you for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? It's stealing your body, it's stealing your craft. At a certain point you want to know, like, where am I? Am I, am I past it? Is the end already happened for me? Am I broken? Or do I have something left? It's sort of like in one of Beckett's plays, this, this guy walks on the stage and he says the following two sentences. He says, uh, I cannot go on, I will go on. Yeah. It's like these two opposites, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like Dan's trying to figure out which sentence is he. Is he the I can't go on or is he the I will go on? And to, the only way to really know that is to stare at the thing that's posing the question, you know? But what if you discover that, that you are are broken? What if you get the wrong answer? This is what Chris was worried about. The big issue for me was what happens to my sense of myself if we get to the performance stage of this project and it turns out that I, I couldn't cut it. And yet, they go on. After a year of reading this play back and forth in their living rooms, Chris and Dan decide, okay, it's time to find a performance space, time to hire a director. Oh, they used to come dragging their asses in rehearsal, looking like, these guys aren't going to be able to go from here to there. That's Joe Gafazi, Chris and Dan's director. Shaky and wiggly, as I used to call them. He's known them for years. You did not call them that. Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, because that's what they were doing. Now Joe says Dan and Chris were two of the best actors he has ever worked with, and oddly enough, in this case, their disease could be an asset. I believe that, because they're halfway home. I mean, they could feel what Beckett's characters in this play were feeling better than anyone. I never felt for a moment this wasn't going to make the play better. If they could get through rehearsals. <laughs> Easier said than done. Take the problem with the medication. Now, both of them... When they're peaking on their meds, they are sharp and they're clear, focused, but when the meds start to taper away, they get cloudy. So the hope was if they were gonna rehearse together, they'd, somehow have to, they'd have to time it just right so that they pop their pills at the right time and rise together, get clear, and then taper off together at the same time. The medication gives you about an hour and a half window. An hour and a half window, it's not a ton of time, but it might be just enough to run a few scenes. That was the thinking. But it wouldn't always work. I'd, some days I'd walk in. And Dan says even when he timed it just right, when it should work perfectly, it wouldn't. I, I would be completely locked up. Or Chris would have these moments where he'd be in the middle of a scene doing great and then suddenly get overwhelmed by fatigue and have to sit down. Didn't have much stamina. So it's like, let's just turn around, go home, or break out the mattresses. Which sometimes Joe says, they actually did. We'd lay around on the floor, we just do something. You'd lay around on the floor? Yeah. I said, let's lay down, let's sit. Why don't we lay down, do the lines laying down? That's actually a great exercise. The point is, rehearsals were often a total bust. And as they got closer and closer to the performance day. Dan would say, take me aside and say, uh, you know, I gotta tell you, Joe, I, I, this is okay, but I'm scared out of my mind. You know, scared out of my mind. It sort of became terrifying. And I, I, I said, well, that's good. You know, <laughs> since when shouldn't we be scared, right, Dan? And then he'd remind Dan of a basic law of the theater. Terrible rehearsals make great performances most of the time. But they knew this was a very different situation. Very different. We're at 15. Oh, thank you, baby. Then came July 13th, last year. The people are coming. The night of the performance. Oh. <laughs> Rosie? 
Are you got our understudies? A couple minutes before the show, Dan calls for the so-called understudies and then runs to the back door to smoke a cigarette. I'm looking out this door and having a cigarette where I looked out and had a cigarette many times before. Everything seems familiar, but I don't belong there. I feel like I, I feel like I, like what am I doing here? He says he kept thinking, how did I think I could do this? I mean, I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm gonna forget lines. I'm not the character. I'm not, I'm not fully the character. I, I haven't rehearsed enough. I haven't had enough rehearsal time. And he says he actually walked out the door, got about halfway out. Cause he's, at that moment he was thinking, you know that, I mean that question, can I or can I, I've got my answer and I'm about to go out in front of hundreds of people and show them nakedly that I am broken, that I can't do this, that it is over. Then he thought, I would started this ball rolling and I couldn't stop it. So, no, just do what you have to do. Just start at the beginning, go until the end and then stop. Okay, so the play begins with Dan in the middle of the stage. He's asleep in a wheelchair, covered by a sheet. Chris paces around behind him, sort of shuffles about, looks out those windows, mumbles. It started off okay. Chris was very worried about getting a laugh. The first sound he makes, he does get a laugh. <laughs> finished! It's finished! After Chris's opening monologue, Dan begins to speak. Can there be misery loftier than mine? So I tried my damnedest to just stay with the story. Moment by moment. Enough. It's time it ended. In the shelter, too. And yet, I hesitate. I hesitate to... to end. Yes, there it is. It's time it ended, and yet I hesitate. And Dan says, as he was up there making that speech, that speech, a funny thing happened. You know, my performance muscles started to take over. His body loosened up. His legs, his arms, his mouth, suddenly they were under his control in a way they hadn't been for months. He could move them without thinking. It's quite remarkable. Cole, yes. Have you not had enough? Yes! We were able to do things on stage. Of what? It was like the disease was gone. That's always the way at the end of the day, isn't it, Chloe? Always. It's the end of the day like any other day, isn't it, Chloe? Looks like it. What's happening? What is happening? Something is taking its course. And then? Right. There we are. There I am. That's enough. It was over. tell you it wasn't perfect. He did miss a couple lines. But somehow, standing up there with Chris in that moment, it didn't seem to matter at all. And then I remember walking backstage and Chris and I just burst into tears. We just started crying. It was not so much about the release of doing it, but I think it had more to do with family. Our kids and our wives, 
and some really good friends could see that there's still uh, some kind of possibility. And I do believe that it was mixed with feelings of like, oh God, I'm gonna miss this. For me, a lot of times when I commit to a project, one of the things that I'm sort of curious about is who, who will I meet in, in the person of me in this project? Who, who will I find in the room when I, when I work on the material? And I was pretty proud of who I found on this one. There's something in this story that, that speaks to all the things we feel about endings. I mean, obviously it hurts, it hurts to end. As, as Dan says, and this is a line that gets me every night, oh God, I'm gonna miss this. But there's also something in what Chris says, that if you stare unblinkingly at the truth, you sometimes find something in yourself that you hadn't seen before, which is in its way, a new beginning. And so it's time. Yeah, it's time to end. You know, we've never quite figured out how to end this show uh, about endings. Except maybe to follow Dan's simple advice. Start at the beginning, go until the end, then stop. Yeah. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've started at the beginning, we've gone to the end. And now, we will stop. Hmm. I'd like to go on a little bit longer, just a little bit. Okay, one more beat. Just one more. Reggie, take us out. <laughs> <laughs>